All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. So glad to be with you. First thing I want to do right up front is apologize to those of you who have coffee on your shirts this morning. I've heard we've had a few casualties this morning. Yes, we upgraded our coffee and donuts to the donuttery, right? Very HB local thing to do. But we've downgraded our lids, apparently. The lids are having some issues, some technical difficulties. So we will reimburse you for the bleach required to fix your shirts after this gathering. Sorry, it's a small sacrifice for us to gather together. Guys, I am just overjoyed every time I think about gathering with you on Sunday mornings in person. I haven't lost the spark, all right, ever since, you know, three weeks ago when we started to regather. And I, and I thought to myself, I said, man, what is this that I'm feeling all the time as I consider our church gathering together? And I thought, you know, maybe it's like that honeymoon period when you're dating somebody and just, you know, the chemicals in your brain are going insane. So you just look at this person as if they can do no wrong sort of thing. Like, is that the state I'm in right now with our community? And I thought, man, that is definitely not it. I've been through some things with this community over the years, but I almost feel like I've entered into that phase as a, as a pastor in this community, sort of like what I've encountered with my wife. 10 years into marriage, that you go through some really difficult times, typically because of me. And on the other side of some of those lessons, there's just this new spaciousness, this new consistent passion and joy and love, unlike anything that I even experienced in that you know, initial honeymoon stage. And I don't say that to shame any of you who feel like you've really been shipwrecked in terms of your marriage experience. God bless you. You're here. You're healing. I'm saying that to convey my love for you as a church family. I'm coming up on 10 years of being a lead pastor in this community. And man, it just feels like I've entered into this spacious place. So if I'm smiling a lot when I'm with you guys, it's not too weird, okay? You know, give me some spaciousness in that. It's just this genuine joy and love and affection that I have for you, my brothers and sisters. Man, and I'm so excited to share with you in this spirituality series. I want to remind you, I took some time on Monday night. We did a live stream teaching called Compassion Culture. It really is, in many ways, I think, a response to a lot of the themes of what we've seen in this last year, guided and directed by the scriptures. You can podcast that. You don't have to go to YouTube. I know a lot of us don't go back to YouTube to watch and listen to things. But when we do these midweek experiences, we're going to be podcasting them. That's live for you to be able to watch and share with others that you think really needs to hear that message. And Wednesday, this night of blessing, do not miss it. I can't wait to hear what these former elders are going to say to bless us as a church community, but I've got some blessings for you out of God's word. Let's turn to John chapter 14. You know, last week we continued in this series entitled Spirituality. We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we, you know, really got to this place of knowing that there isn't a single part, not one ounce of our faith in Christianity and walk with Jesus that isn't in some way empowered by the Holy Spirit. At least that's what Paul asserts in that really powerful chapter. The Holy Spirit is integrated with everything that we are as a Christian. And I ended with answering this common question that I think a lot of us face. You know, how do I know that the voice that I'm hearing in my heart and mind is actually the voice of God and not my own voice? And I asked you this, look, is that a thought or an impulse that you have in your heart that conforms to Christ? Is it a thought or impulse that originates in the mind of God? Is it something that accords with God's word? Well, then according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that is the thoughts of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and mind to move us in our own heart and mind to harmonize with him. Okay, and so we're going to continue deepening our understanding of what that is, that the Holy Spirit is doing in us as he harmonizes our heart and mind with the heart and mind of God. In the coming weeks, we'll talk about spiritual gifts. We'll even get into some of the contentious topics like tongues. I know you're saying, do we really need to go there after this last year and all the arguments we've had? We're really just going to go through it according to what God's word says. We're not going to be afraid of what God's word says. We're just going to learn from it. So there's a lot of great topics we're going to go into in the next couple of weeks before we go back in the Matthew series. But I want to deepen our understanding of what it means for the Holy Spirit to be harmonizing our heart and mind with the heart and mind of God through God's holy living presence. To do that, we're going to go to John chapter 14, where you may have turned right now. We're going to start reading in verse 15. This is a passage where Jesus speaks about 
the giving of the Holy Spirit a couple different ways. And we're going to see some themes emerge for why the Holy Spirit is even being gifted to us in the first place. It's really going to you know, fall in line with many of the things we've been talking about the last several weeks. But verse 15, this is the words of Jesus in one of his final discourses before going to the cross. He says, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, right? When I go to the cross, when I'm resurrected and return to the Father, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord... Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. He's been saying this a couple times. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Very similar to 1 Corinthians 2. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus is very direct with his people here. He says it a couple times. If you love me and that love is genuine, what are you going to do? You're going to obey my commands. He says it multiple times, multiple ways. And then he speaks immediately after that first initial time of saying that in verse 15. In verse 16, he speaks of the promised Holy Spirit that he's going to give to his people. He says, if you love me, and that's going to be evidenced by your desire to fulfill my commands, my Father is going to send into your life another advocate. I'm an advocate for you, but you're going to receive another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Who's that advocate? The Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And this is very much akin to the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. We studied it two weeks ago. In it, God says, looking forward to the time of Jesus, to God's people, look, I'm going to put my living presence in you, my people, and I'm going to move you to do what people were incapable of doing in the past, actually living into my righteous decrees actually following my laws, actually doing the very thing that Jesus is calling for right here, obedience to his commands. You know, I have this cargo bike that I purchased uh, during COVID uh, to be able to get outside and be active with my kids. And so I place all my kids in this cargo bike, at least the four of them, not the new fifth one. But the four of them will go in the front of the cargo bike there. And guys, when I load up that 150 pounds a kid, it is impossible for me, between the weight of them and the weight of the bike, to move that bike anywhere. Okay, I don't care how big the gear is that you put on that bike. No matter how much effort I put into it, it looks like I'm a goofball completely. Like I am totally weak. And actually, you know, it has an electric assist. Otherwise, it'd just be sitting in the garage. And uh, one time I ran out of battery just as I was entering into the south side of my neighborhood. And I live on the north side of the neighborhood. And there was a line of cars, you know, picking up their kids from the school that's in our neighborhood. And there I was running out of battery, literally going one eighth of a mile per hour with all these kids in the front cheering me on. I told them, you need to give me moral support right now. Can you imagine me, like, grinding on the gears, sweating while my kids are chanting and people are sitting in their cars going, what is wrong with that man right there? <laughs> Did he purchase that on purpose? It looks like a clown car. But, you know, that's basically the way that the Bible speaks about our ability to live into the righteousness of God just simply by the laws of God, the rules of the religion of the Old Testament. There was nothing wrong with them, but we didn't have the capacity to actually obey God from our hearts. And yet, God gave us his Holy Spirit. It's sort of like that electric assist. Man, I can just make the motions with my feet, and I can go like 25 miles per hour with those kids in the front. I know, it sounds a little dangerous. Don't judge me for that. 
But, but that's the sort of capacity that God said he would give us in the Holy Spirit. I will move you. I will help you to be able to fulfill what my people previously could not fulfill. Now Judas, not Judas Iscariot, all right, this is one of the good Judases, asks an interesting question. John is very careful about that. Why is Jesus only revealing this consequential truth regarding his Holy Spirit and the help that he's going to provide to the disciples and not to the whole world? And Jesus basically says in verse 23, look, Those who love me are going to follow my commands. It's open invite. Anybody who wants in on this experience, if you love my commands, if you love what I'm telling you, if you place your faith in me, guess what? You're in. I will make my home with you. My father will make his home with you. And I say that to the people on the furthest fringes of this church gathering. I'm saying physically. I know some of you did that by choice. You're totally in with Jesus on the edge there on the lawn. But, you know, some of us spiritually who are on the fringe of this gathering, you're wondering, "Eh, do I have a place in this whole thing? Am I on the inside? Jesus says, open invite. If you love my commands, if you love what I'm sharing with you, if you believe I'm of God, you just need to apply that intent. You just need to bring that trust to me, that faith to me, and I'll make my home with you. Those who don't love me, well, they're not going to obey my commands. They're just going to throw them aside. But what I want to point out here is all this talk of obedience that's brought up again leads Jesus to again cite the activity of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. Jesus says, immediately following this talk of obedience, after I go, the advocate, the Holy Spirit will be sent by my Father, and he will continue to teach you all these things and remind you of everything I have said. Very similar, like I said, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But you see, all throughout this passage, if you read it, John 14, there are these two interconnected ideas. Love expressed through obedience to Jesus, empowered and motivated by his Holy Spirit, and a pressing into the Holy Spirit, which leads to love and obedience to Jesus. I'm going to go back to a bicycle analogy. You're getting a twofer today because I've been biking a lot lately. Can't you tell? And I'm just kidding. You can't tell. I know. But it's sort of like the two pedals on a bike. Those are those two interconnected ideas. If you want to move to love Jesus in obedience, that is going to be motivated by God's Holy Spirit. If you want to press into the Holy Spirit, that is going to result in love and obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ. He is called the Holy Spirit after all. So if we're going to be more filled with the Spirit, we're going to be filled with the holiness of God. You know, there are a lot of people today who think that you can be spiritual without being holy. That you can be a spiritual person without being a holy person. And this isn't a new thought that we just came up with today in our culture. It's something that stretches way back thousands of years ago. It's actually an issue that Paul had to confront the Corinthian church on because here they were, this group of believers, this church, and they were not drama free, all right? They were living a life of indulgence according to the standards of the prevailing culture around them, i.e. they were paying customers of prostitutes. Wow, all right? Church has always been a little dramatic at times. They're paying customers of prostitutes, those who are following Jesus, and Paul has to confront that. And he's confronting it because there was sort of this false spirituality that was being promoted in the church. The church was coming together, and everybody's taking their turn sharing, and they've got all this prophecy, these words that are coming from God. And apparently somewhere along the way, someone spoke on behalf of God and said, look, guys, Jesus has done such an amazing work. We've attained to this higher level of super spirituality. It doesn't matter what we do with our bodies anymore. Sounds a lot like classic American spirituality, doesn't it? I mean, have you ever heard that line from someone before? Like, I'm not a religious person, I'm spiritual. You know, that's rich anytime you hear that, right? You go, oh yeah, I wonder what that means. I'm spiritual is American for, I diffuse oils in my household, I watch planet Earth, and I do whatever I want with my body. That's basically what I'm spiritual means translated from American, like literally, like I do a couple holistic things and I basically am my own moral guide, you know, and you're like, wow, very deep. You're a very spiritual person, right? No, Paul speaks to the church and says, what you do with your body does matter. 
Because to be truly spiritual, to be led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to be led into holiness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's where I want to go next. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 15. And this is basically Paul telling the Christians that their bodies do matter eight different ways. Okay, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? Your body matters. Something happens when you use your body that is hitting on different levels. For it is said that two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. There's layers here, guys. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He's just saying, like I said, eight different ways. Guys, your bodies matter. Like, do you not know that through believing in Jesus, you've received this down payment on attorney, the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, God's living presence in you. And so now when you use your body in such a way that you're uniting with a prostitute, you're actually uniting God with this prostitute. That's what's happening here. You know, Paul is trying to pastor them into an aha moment. I think it's very similar to the aha moment like a chain smoker gets when they find out they've been diagnosed with lung cancer. You know, they've been doing this activity this whole time, you know, and there's this unperceptible amount of damage that they're doing to themselves and it feels very disconnected from any reality and then they hear the word you've got lung cancer and it's like whoa wait a minute my body does matter my actions do matter and now they come with amazing consequences in my life I think Paul is trying to do that same thing with the believers. You guys think none of this matters in your bodies and your actions, what you're doing? Do you not see? Do you not see what you're inviting into your life? The illness, the cancer that is being brought into you spiritually in your heart and mind? You know, it's like they're taking this fine work of art like a Rembrandt and they're just smearing filth on it. He goes, you are profaning the temple of God that is your body. So if you and I want to talk about, and we are talking about in this series, the work of the Spirit, if we want to talk about spirituality, holiness and righteousness will not be a footnote in the discussion. It will be the note. There is no way for us to be spiritual. There is no way for us to encounter the Spirit without increasing holiness in our lives. Think of the holiness of Christ conveyed in the teachings of Matthew. You know, we paused you know, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking about purity, sexual purity. And what does he say? He says, I don't even want you to look at someone with lust in your heart. I don't even want you to see someone and desire to possess them sexually somewhere deep beneath the surface in you. I want that completely eradicated from your life. And that was the way that Jesus lived. He wasn't just telling us what to do. This is the way he operated in ministry. So think of the purity of Jesus' ministry. He's going around helping all these people in the crowds, and there's not one person he's looking at and seeking to dominate sexually. All of it is a pure experience. And Jesus is saying, look, if you love my commands, if you love my ways, then I am going to put my spirit in you and move you to be that same type of person. I'm going to enable you to rout out all that sin even deep in your heart. You're going to have that heart level sort of purity because you're becoming like me through my Holy Spirit. You're becoming like my Father in heaven. But when most of us think of the Spirit-empowered life, do we think of heart level purity as evidence of somebody who is spiritual, as evidence of somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that one of the first things that comes to mind? their sexual purity. That's how you know someone's filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, it should be something that comes to mind, clearly from the scriptures. And yet that sexual aspect of our lives is just one aspect of the total nature of God's holiness. And of course, we know the Holy Spirit is working to harmonize all of our mind and heart with all of who God is. 
I want you to take note of this. The pursuit of the Spirit, what we've seen, is the pursuit of obeying Jesus in love. There is no way that we can claim to be a spiritual person without holiness. The pursuit of the Spirit is the pursuit of obeying Jesus in love, loving what he commanded and being conformed into that holiness. Now, I want us to pause for a second. I want us to consider what is it that we think of when we think of someone who's spiritual? When we look at somebody and we go, man, what are the indicators that somebody is a spiritual person? What do you look for? That would, you just go, man, they're very spiritual. What, what comes to mind for you? Joy. I think that's a great answer. There's a supernatural joy in them. You know, I'd say peace, right? You're going to the fruit of the Spirit. And that's where we're going to be going this morning. Amen, brother. You have discernment. But not all of us do. Sometimes we operate from a very worldly perspective. We think about, man, somebody who's very spiritual, there's somebody who must be working miracles or something. You know, there's somebody who must be prophesying and speaking the words of God. There's somebody with a particular gift, like somebody who's preaching on a stage. That makes somebody very spiritual. You know, I'm going to get to the gifts. We're going to talk about the gifts. We're going to go into all of it, like I said. But even if you set aside the gifts, I think sometimes when we try to define someone who feels spiritual to us, we kind of think like, man, I, there's something about someone who's spiritual. It's kind of like they've got this gravitas to them, you know? They've got this gravity to their personality. You know, there's a weightiness when they're in the room. They can really work a room with who they are and how they present themselves to be. And I look at them and I go, wow, that's kind of a spiritual person. And I want us to stop right there because I think that's one of the issues with us in defining what is spiritual and in defining the work of the Spirit. A lot of times I think we can't really put our finger on it. We can't really describe what it is. And so we end up making all these very unspiritual people considered spiritual. And then they reveal how unspiritual they are after the fact, right? It's because the whole time we were going, hmm, there's just something about that person. Well, you better be able to describe what that something is. And full disclosure in my parenting, if one of my daughters comes to me and says, I'm really into this boy, okay, I'm listening. You know, immediately, I'm into this boy. I'm listening. I'm on the edge of my seat, right? I'm really into this boy. Man, there's just something about him. I don't know what it is. I'm gonna say, first question out of my mouth, well, what is it? Tell your dad, what is it? What is it about this guy? I don't know. I can't really put my finger on it. There's just something about him. I'm really drawn to him. I'm going to say, no, literally tell me, what is it? You have to be able to tell me what it is about this individual. It can't just be this sense, this feeling that you get from them. Because if you can't tell me what it is, there may not be anything there at all. You see, everything Jesus said tells us everything that is spiritual. Okay, take note of that. Everything that Jesus said is everything that is defined as spiritual. And Jesus told us a lot of things that you can point to and you can put your finger on and you can explain exactly what it is. Okay, it shouldn't be this undefinable reality. It has to be something that we can point to in each other's lives. Consider just one aspect of Jesus' teaching. Consider how Jesus defined greatness. He said, the least would be greatest. And in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, the greatest among us would be our what? Our slave. So you can take your undefinable gravitas and shove it because that is not spirituality. That is how the elites of Jesus' day would walk around trying to promote their spirituality. And it was an empty circus. And you've got the same circus going on today with brand new performers in their place. Jesus says, you want to know what's spiritual? You're going to take up a life of service. Is that what we think about when we think about somebody filled with the Holy Spirit? Somebody who takes part of their Sunday and packs up all these materials into the truck? Oh, wow, look at that spirit-empowered life while they pack up the truck. But that's what Jesus says. He says that's what's greatness in the kingdom of God. Consider what it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 3. When the apostles are overwhelmed with the duties of the early church and you know, it's just multiplying the work of God. They say, man, we need some help. So they appoint these seven deacons. And deacon is another word for, it's a grand title in the church, servant. So they're appointing these seven servants. And they've got to have on their resume this criteria fulfilled that they're going to be full of the Holy Spirit in Acts 6, 3, and filled with wisdom. So we need to find some really spiritual guys filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom. And what was the earth-shattering, consequential set of responsibilities and tasks that these individuals were going to be given because they're filled with the Holy Spirit? 
food distribution. A little anticlimactic, right? Food distribution. Among the widows in the early church, between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews, Oh, wow. Could you believe it that there was cultural division back in the ancient world? People arguing over things that they shouldn't be arguing about. Guess what? Take it all the way back to the book of Acts. There it is. These widows are arguing over someone's being left out. And so who's going to be put in charge of administrating this unity and the distribution of these resources? It's these individuals filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Right? How spiritual. Oh, but it is. But it is. As a pastor, I don't even have the time of day for what most people consider as truly spiritual. Because I know the people that roll up their sleeves. And I know the people that open their homes. And I know the people that give of their resources. And you can point to your spirituality as some undefinable magnetism that this person has. And I'll point to their actions. And I'll point to their character, which reflects the character and holiness of God. The point is illustrated well enough when you look at the qualifications of elders. This is, you know, the highest level of leadership in the local church. It's got to be a job that you need some spirituality for, right? You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what are the qualities that are looked for in Titus chapter 1? Is it that they've got to be really compelling and talented and successful and powerful individuals? So when you get in their presence, you just sense, wow, this is someone who's larger than life. Is that what they say are the requirements of an elder? Now look at it, Titus chapter 1, faithful to their spouses, temperate, not given to anger, gentle, respectable, hospitable, not given to drunkenness, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, managing his household well, even has a good reputation with outsiders. I think we read that and we go, ah, pretty granola, pretty granola, (laughs) only because the world has fallen into complete amnesia over what is healthy and what is character. If you read that list, nothing sounds more radical and revolutionary in our world than someone who looks like that. And if you were to read and apply all the teachings of Jesus throughout the Gospels, what you get is this in an individual in ways that you can point to and touch and demonstrate and see in the conduct of their lives. This is the fruit. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But that brawling and that anger and the filthy speech and bitterness and envy, which is the inverse of all these qualities that Paul warns about in Ephesians chapter 4, the common life of 2020, right? Brawling and anger and filthy speech and bitterness and envy, that common life of this world that Paul warns about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, grieves the Holy Spirit with whom we were given to seal us for the day of redemption. And yet I've seen such an example fostered through supposedly spiritual people. That's an example that grieves God, that tears his spirit in two. That's a word, grief, for deep anguish and sorrow. For to be filled with the spirit is to be ever more filled with the life of Christ and living in accord with him. So when we reject the generosity of Christ, we are rejecting the prompting of the Holy Spirit to move us to give our resources. When we reject the graciousness of Christ in our conduct with one another, we are rejecting the leading, the prompting of the living presence of God within you to share the grace that you have first received. On and on and on. Anytime there's that prompting in us to live into the example of Christ, it's one that's brought to us by the living presence of God. And we had better not grieve him any longer. For we're called to walk, to live in step with the Spirit. And the fruit and evidence of that is going to be that love, that joy, that peace. That patience, that kindness, that goodness, that gentleness, that self-control. That is the mark of spirituality. That is the mark of the work of the Spirit. It's a life of character that reflects the character of God, the holiness of God. I don't want for any of us to think that this journey of spirituality is something that is hard to figure out, difficult to discern. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was given for us to understand what God has freely given us. 
God wants us to know who he is, what he desires of us. He wants to help us along in it. But we have to lean into the leading of the Spirit if we're going to see that growth in our own lives. Let's seek the Spirit's leading this morning. Would you pray with me as I invite the band back up? Lord Jesus, I want to start in repentance. In saying, Lord, that a lot of times what we consider to be spiritual is not at all spiritual. It's completely the values of this world. It's what mankind and womankind would look for apart from you. But you've taught us a different way. You've shown us what is truly spiritual. You've shown us what your character is. You've shown us what is holiness. And Lord, if we're pressing into the Holy Spirit and your presence alive in our bodies, then right along with that is that motivation to love you, Jesus, and to follow in your commands. If we don't love your commands, Jesus, we don't love you. And we're not moving in accord with your Holy Spirit who's guiding us. Lord, are we really seeking that total transformation of our mind and heart? Have we been relying on your Holy Spirit? Have we been going our own path, defining it for ourselves? Or we don't want to just feel spiritual the way that this world does, completely apart from holiness. There is no spirituality apart from your holiness. Help us to love your commands again. Help us to desire to be like you again from the depths of our heart, to not resist generosity, to not resist grace giving, to not resist that preferring of others. You said the greatest would be what? A servant, a slave to their brothers and sisters. You made it so clear how we can pursue your Holy Spirit. You made it so clear how we could pursue your character and service and humility. Holy Spirit, would we listen for your voice? Would we listen for your thoughts? Would our view be eclipsed by your view of the world? Lord, may we not grieve you. Your Holy Spirit has been grieved in so many ways. Whether it's because of our actions physically in our bodies whether it's the way we've related to others that stands in opposition to what you clearly said. Bring conviction in our lives, God, not because you're condemning us, but because you want us to feel that discord when we're not in step with your Holy Spirit. That conviction isn't bad. We never want to lose that conviction. We never want to become comfortable with evil. We want to learn to love what is good. So if you need to bring conviction for areas in people's lives this morning that are not in step with you, that are not in line with you, if you need to bring about repentance, then do so. That you might heal us. That you might encourage us and uplift us. stand with me this morning. I encourage you as we sing, as we sing of our God, as we sing of his character, as we sing of who he is, as we receive the promise of the very words that we sing, I ask that you would continue to pray that God would give you that love for his ways from your own heart. That is what they could never receive without the Holy Spirit. They were just following rules, trying to attain to righteousness. God said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to make you obey. I'm going to move you to obey. I'm going to help you to live this life from the inside, from a pure heart. That passion to love the ways of Jesus again, and in that way, love him. That's what we should be asking for as we sing his praise. Would you ask for it along with me as we worship him?